good morning people so well welcome to success tree classes so today we will do india yearbook 2016 and most probably we will complete this book in the next coming three to four classes so if you like the videos you can uh, hit like and you can subscribe to our channel as well so here we go uh, come to first chapter so today uh, in the next around three to four classes we will do this in the airbook can you slow down the speed of camera so the importance of this book if you see uh, there are around it's a very bulky book in fact none uh, even man, it, it discourages us as well to read this anyways it has 32 chapters and uh, importance if you see what I think so you can expect around 10 to 15 questions from this book huh? why are these number of questions 15 questions around I, I expect even certain questions that come from polity or geography so many questions many see you have the polity chapter in this uh, book okay but this polity chapter is covered in around uh, uh, 30 to 40 pages the Lakshmi Kant is a very bulky book you read it multiple times okay that's fine but if you want to revise the whole polity and so within 30 40 pages within one and a half hour you can revise the whole uh, polity in the brief sense and even within this polity portion you can get around five to six questions so it's very you can say productive for the revision purpose Certain things you can find here in this, but you won't find in the Lakshmi Kant. So that's why still I recommend going through the polity portion. The first chapter, if you see, is the land and the people. Now it uh, talks about the various geographical uh, studies of ours. So even though you have done NCRT, and so NCRTs are the crux of you can say the whole geography. NCRTs and the GC Leung. But still it will help you to get uh, more understanding and certain facts which are there in the India book but you won't find in the NCRDs. So these things you can uh, just understand and relate with your NCRD preparation, NCRD books as well. So the first chapter that is the land and the people. Okay, see the first page if you see that. In this, so when I say the question are say 10 to 15 questions from uh, India book, it means if it comes from geography portion, it is there in India book. So you can say it is from India book or from geography and CRD. So that is up to your understanding. So even I'll count those questions as well that are that have come from India book. Okay. So our country is the seventh largest country in the world. If you know uh, what are the other one. Now you see uh, the third paragraph of the first page. It tells about the latitude and longitude and extent given in NCRT as well. Mm -hmm. Now what do you need what do we need to remember they won't ask the latitude I believe latitude and longitude exact the facts. But you see the extent north to south extent is 3214 kilometers and east to west 2933 kilometer. Even I don't think so they will they will not ask about that uh, exact how much. But still you should remember that north to south is more. So in this a brief understanding you can have, okay fine, north to south extent is more than the east to west. Despite their degrees are same you can say, if you subtract the 37.6 minus 8.4, 97.25 minus 68.68.7, so almost same extent you will find it. Are you getting this thing? But despite this north to south extent is more than the south than the east to west so this has a brief understanding somewhat more than 3000 north to south somewhat less than 3000 east to west it will do the work then we have land frontier how much 15200 kilometers see these are facts you can find it at many of the different places but given here in the yearbook as well it is important moreover the coastline total coastline you should remember this thing you can use this coastline while writing certain answer in mains as well when there uh, comes importance of certain coast or whatever our when we discuss our maritime affairs and all 
so how much is the cost line yeah 7 1516.6 kilometers is our coastline including the islands then you come to the next one physical background you see the na uh, neighbors neighbors of India India to which India shares a border you find what Afghanistan Afghanistan and Pakistan so Afghanistan is our neighbor we share our borders with Afghanistan it doesn't matter at all whether it is POK that is sharing the borders with Afghanistan, but we claim POK. So as government of India claims POK, so POK is our part, India's part. And from the UPSC point of view, Afghanistan shares borders with India. So this is the only point other uh, neighbors you know about, which neighbor, which are our other neighbors. Okay. So Afghanistan, Pakistan in the northwest, in north we have China, Nepal, Bhutan. Then Bangladesh and Myanmar in our eastern part. So uh, the members of SARC, our neighbors are our members of SARC, but leaving China. Myanmar and China. So even Myanmar, even though Myanmar it lies in South Asia, means uh, though in the southern part, but it is not part. It is our neighbor, but it is not part of the SARC. Rest certain countries like the island countries like Sri Lanka, Maldives they are in fact. Moreover, India shares a largest border means with Bangladesh. Okay. What after Bangladesh? Are you sure? Because Bangladesh it becomes very common question. Even I think MPPCS they ask this question now. Okay. Uh -huh. So, but they may not ask, UPSC may not ask, UPSC may ask, uh, arrange them, arrange them in decreasing order. Okay, so it is the Bangladesh largest border, then China, yeah, then Pakistan, then Nepal, then Myanmar, then Bhutan and then Afghanistan. So this is the order. So I have highlighted the points in this ebook, and at certain places I have added certain notes as well. So once you go, you make your cursor over to that part, you will find certain point of thing. You, okay, you can add up the notes. So here, say I have arranged uh, these as certain additional notes. Okay. So I I have arranged certain uh, the, say the number of countries sharing border and the. In the decreasing order, I have arranged them. So, Bangladesh, China, Pak, Nepal, Myanmar, Bhutan, and Afghanistan. Okay, fine. Now, come to the next physical features. See, read. You, you have to read the whole one, but certain selectively. I am discussing only where to give more focus. So, पढ़ना आपको सारा का सारा है, but certain portion के give more focus. Say physical features. Okay, if the, they ask the question. You listen to the question. Which passes? makes the way for India-China trade route via Chumbi Valley. Now they will give the options, for example, uh, Shipkila Pass, Nathula Pass, Jalapla Pass, Banihal Pass, or certain other passes. So what do you think so? Which of these passes form the Silk Route between India? Not Silk Route, the trade route between India and China via Chumbi Valley. So it has given two hints. It comes on the trade route. Secondly, via Chumbi Valley. Now you should have the idea where the Chumbi Valley is, and it is quite strategic portion, strategic for China and for India as well. Now, how Chumbi Valley is important? The Chumbi Valley is a kind of narrow strip. Open your atlas. Chumbi Valley. Sikkim is a narrow strip between Sikkim and Bhutan. Just try to locate in the political map, you won't find the name there, but just try to find the narrow strip. Do you see this narrow strip? This strip is Chumbi Valley. So even though if you know Chumbi Valley, where the Chumbi Valley is, then you'll try to figure it out, okay, uh, so these passes must be in the Sikkim. 
then you try to recall which are the passage in Sikkim. Which are the passage in Sikkim? Nathula and Jalipla. Jalipla pass and Nathula pass. So in uh, certain pictures I have seen, uh, if you want to see this, Jalipla, can you, can, you, uh, can you see this? Is a Chumbi Valley? Okay, fine. Is a Jalipla? And this is Nathula. This is a Chumbi Valley, Jalipla, Nathula, this is a trade route. Okay. So uh, you just see this and uh, locate this in your India Air Book. In India Air Book, you find this in the second paragraph. The high altitudes. Physical features, second paragraph. The high altitudes admit travel only to a few passes, notably Jalapla and Nathula, on the main Indo Tibet trade route through Chumbi Valley, northeast of Darjeeling. So, this is the line that can come directly in the statement, correct, incorrect, or they can ask the way I, how I, I ask the question. Then you know Shipkila, where the Shipkila is, Himachal. So, Satluj River come across Shipkila Pass, if you remember. Now, mountain wall. 2400 kilometers around. Okay, now what do you find? The same length is of the plains as well, Ganga Indus plain. See the next paragraph 2400 kilometers again. So, these passes, so what your task will be? You need to go through all the passes of India, see their importance. For example, in, uh, in Jammu and Kashmir, Burjal Pass, Banihal Pass, see which pass is. Uh, Links Jammu to Kashmir, okay, Burjil or Banihal, where this pass remains, where the Kashmir is, but in which mountains you find the Kashmir Valley? Mm -hmm. And Peer Punjab. Correct. Greater Himalaya than Peer Punjab. Now come uh, to the next paragraph there, do you see the desert regions, the deserts of India? So we have deserts in Rajasthan, the great Indian desert. So this India book talks about it divides the desert region into two parts, great desert and little desert. Now this classification you won't find in the NCRD books, great desert, little desert. So they can ask directly which region signifies the great desert, then they can give the uh, statements. So here they have directly written it, now read the lines directly from there. Great desert extends from edge of run of Kutch beyond the Luni river northward. So Rajasthan's in frontier come across this. Then little desert extends from the Luni between Jaisalmer and Jodhpur up to northwest. Next line is also important, between these two de deserts, great and little one, now, a sterile country lies, it is a very highly infertile, it consists of the limestone ridges, rocky land and cut across by limestone ridges. So, limestones, you understand limestones, have you seen the topography, limestone topography? You may find this in uh, GC Leon, there is a cast topography, limestone. So try to just uh, recall what are the physical features and what kind of do you find any agriculture? No, very very limited one. So it's not suitable for the agriculture, and it is not also inhabited. People very scattered population you find it. So here you can find the limestone ridges between these two uh, deserts. Then if you see the southern part of plateau. Okay, Nilgiri Hills, southern part of plateau where the southern part of plateau meets it is around Nilgiri Hills, okay. Nilgiri Hills the, is a hill where both the western guard and eastern guard they meet. So the question can come where west, the, uh, the place, the hills that subsumes both or that connects both western guard and eastern guard, that is Nilgiri Hills. 
or the question can come the southernmost point of eastern ghat that is again nilgiri hills what about western ghat western ghat still extend below it okay that is anamlai hills kadamam hills they are southward extension of western ghat so you need to read how the geological structure how this uh, uh, this plateau region formed gondwana land out of this uh, you can say lava that came out basalt re basalt rocks is are formed of deccan trap so deccan trap is in what region the black soil the gujarat maharashtra region okay where that is quite suitable for the cotton cultivation so yes so so you can find how the geological uh, structure had been of our various physiographic regions Pl plains you remember uh, uh, submerged region it was so out of the so uh, the various rivers that kept on depositing the sediments himalayas came out why because of the compression between the two plates so out of the tethys sea it emerged out so few things you just go through how it emerged i just want to uh, make you understand the importance of india air book even regarding geography perspective river system you see in the river system the major rivers i believe you know so you need to understand uh, need to remember and recall over the rivers their tributaries important rivers and their tributaries now today in uh, rivers are important like ganga yamuna their tributaries okay fine and same with brahmaputra so ganga ganga brahmaputra plain right so tributaries of brahmaputra even they can ask the question like this so brahmaputra it's known by what name in uh, tibet in china no in sangpo 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 there in uh, china you can see this in the river system second paragraph somewhere in the last then when it enters into india so in arunachal it is known by dihang okay then near pasi ghat dibang and lohit joins brahmaputra so dibang is a tributary of brahmaputra whereas dihang is a name of brahmaputra in arunachal so tributary to brahmaputra dibang and lohit here and further more tributaries you see the next paragraph subansri jia bhareli dhansri puthimari pagladiya and manas these are the tributaries in this plain region brahmaputra plain then in bangladesh the tributary is tista so it is important question tista now tista joins brahmaputra now you know this thing but where it joins in india or in bangladesh in bangladesh it joins so it comes out from sikkim flows into bangladesh meets brahmaputra river there okay so tista is a river which has changed its course as well from uh, west to east the question is important tista you, you should know all the tributaries of brahmaputra river so uh, lohit and dibang are uh, its left bank tributaries or right bank tributaries left bank tributaries okay dhansri again no it is coming from uh, below again left bank tributaries subansri is the right bank tributary so try to go through all these locate these rivers in your atlas okay you, you may not find all the rivers in your atlas say puchimari pagladia but certain rivers you can find it others you can remember then another important river of north eastern region is barak river it is again very important this year you can expect the question from northeast the question comes generally but now uh, with the brak river how it is important now brak is not the brak obama well is a brak river here in that is high water in that water correct good so is a proposed next inland waterway how many inland waterways do we have we have number 1 one from no no correct no 
अलाह बाद जो फल दिया ओके सेकंड वन सत्या जो ढूंढ रही ओके थर्ड इन केरला रीजन कोटाम तू कोलापुर कोलाम तू कोटापुर ओके देन इन कोलाम तू कोटापुर देन फोर्थ सेकंड थर्ड फोर्थ वन अलोंग अलोंग या कृष्णा गोदावरी बेसिन तमिलनाडु आंध्र प्रदेश इट कनेक्ट्स देन फिफ्थ इन दिस इन ओडिशा रीजन ओडिशा समवर्ड वेस्ट बंगाल यू जस्ट कीप फोन मूविंग अपवर्ड्स ओके सो इट्स ब्राह्मी बैटरनी मानदी एंड अबो रीजन्स ऑफ वेस्ट बंगाल सो बाय ऑफ कैनाल्स रिवर्स आर लिंक्ड एंड वाटरवेज फॉर्म्स वी हैव दिस फाइव इलेंड वाटरवेज now sixth one is proposed one this one in the barak valley so various rivers in the north east they will be connected by way of canals or whatever way and this river water system inland water way will be formed that is one that is what barak on the barak river barak rivers in tributaries now barak is a major river so if you, you find in north east you can divide the river system in the two parts one is the tributaries of Brahmaputra and Brahmaputra River, okay. So major, most of the rivers in North East either they are joining Brahmaputra or Barak. So this can make you understand a better way how where the rivers, all the rivers are going. So maximum rivers either joining Brahmaputra or Barak, and Barak also finally going into Bangladesh joining Meghna. It is further how uh, Brahmaputra comes forward. So. The Barak River it originates from Manipur Hills. You can find this now. It is written there. The Barak, the head stream of Meghna, rises in the hills of Manipur. These are various tributaries of Barak River. Barak continues in Bangladesh till the combined Ganga Brahmaputra joins it near Bharat Bazar. So more yeah, about yeah yeah. When it enters, the barrack when it enters, normally it is known as Meghna. Yeah, it had stream of, uh, it joins there further. Okay. More information found out like in uh, North East Yojana, many, one of the chapter was basically over the environment conservation and over these. So various river system they have discussed, various uh, flora and fauna in the North East they have discussed. So you can expect a question from that chapter. So go back home, read that four or five times. Definitely one question you can get it from there. So one article, one chapter worth reading multiple times. In our peninsula, we have major river basins: Krishna. So Godavari is the largest one in the peninsular India as a river basin. So in India, it is the second one. Godavari is the southern peninsula and second largest river basin of India. So river basin means the area being drained by the rivers, the main river and its tributaries. So Godavari is the largest river basin in southern India in the peninsular India, followed by Krishna, Mahanadi, Narmada, and then Kaveri. So, Ganga Brahmaputra this basin. So, you find, you see, Godavari, then Krishna, and then Mahanadi, and then Narmada. Narmada is the west flowing rivers. So, maximum rivers in the peninsula, they are east flowing, uh, draining into Bay of Bengal. In terms of their uh, land, or in terms of, in terms of their basin area, largest Godavari, then Krishna, then Mahanadi, then Narmada, that is a west flowing river, Rift Valley River that we have. There are certain inland drainage rivers as well, Luni, Makuru, Pen, Saraswati, Banas, Ghaggar, etc. And there are 12 major river basins you find there in the next paragraph Indus, Ganga, Brahmaputra, Meghna, Godavari, Krishna, Kaveri, Manadi, Pennar. So many of the rivers you know, so read their uh, tributaries Pennar, Brahmani, Betarni, Sabarmati, Mahi, Narmada, Tapti. 
okay now different name of rivers you find somewhat pennar brahmi betterni sabarmati i believe you know about it in gujarat it is okay mahi also there so you can find mahi so mahi and sabarmati both are draining into arabian sea tapti so out of these rivers sabarmati mahi narmada and tapti these drain into arabian sea rest of all these rivers so indus also drains into arabian sea yes correct so apart from indus sabarmati mahi narmada and tapti rest drain into rio bengal because indus it uh, it occupies very less area very uh, it, it it maximum area by drained by indus that lies in pakistan now brahmi betterni where this river is you can locate this river system in odisha so open your atlas locate brahmi betterni so once you are doing the uh, india air book carry atlas with you as well also carry pen and paper so that you can note down which portion remains important for mains so when you are doing mains you can mark down as say m mains and prelims like this <coughs> you won't find but open the orissa map Do you see there, Brahmi Betterni? How is it important? You see, on the banks of Brahmi Betterni, you find Bihar Kanika. Do you look at Bihar Kanika? Bihar Kanika National Park, Wildlife Sanctuary. It is. Do you find it? it must be there somewhat south to the part of it bitar kanika so upsc has asked questions before as well regarding this yeah regarding the bitar kanika So, Bihar Kanika. Uh, first of all, you should know on which river system. So, it's very uh, near to Mahanadi River system as well, but it lies on the intertidal zone and estuarial waters of Bihar Kanika Betterni River system. Bihar Kanika it is uh, famous for salt water crocodiles. So, it's a breeding ground for salt water crocodiles. Okay. So, where do you find a salt water crocodile in India? Along the coastal region, definitely. So, but this is certain breeding ground. Where do you find it? Now, do you see that that Ganjam as well, the place, southern part? Just below that, somewhat not so far away from Bihar Kanika, somewhere south in Atlas, G A N J M. Do you see that? Yeah, it's a breeding ground for the olive ridley turtles. Olive ridley turtles. Olive ridley turtles. Show me once. Right, so it's a place you find there, Chilka Lake. Right, so many times you might have seen in uh, news as well. Certain times, uh, these olive ridley turtles they come and they lay their eggs. 
on the coastal uh, sands nearby the Chilka Lake. Again, I'll come back. So you need to go through these river systems, find their importance. Pennar, where the Pennar is, Tamil Nadu. Okay, so you can again locate Pennar once you go back home. So all these rivers you should know, and the tributaries as well. So one question you know will come from the rivers and the tributaries. At least one question. And come to the next. Uh, that is climate and seasons. You should know on Broadway, we live in a monsoon climate. India lies in the monsoon climatic region. Okay. Which month do you find the hottest month in North India? April or May? Which, re which month is the hottest month in the South India? Yes. April, May or June? May. It's April. See how it happens because you see the apparent moment of the sun. So sun rays they are overhead at sudden place at certain period of time and they moves right so in May June time they are overhead over around Tropic of Cancer in December they are overhead over Tropic of Capricorn so and in around September around August September season they are overhead around Equator okay so so they moves northward from uh, December to May June time. So once sun rays are over at a certain place that will be the hottest period of that particular place. So once they are moving towards Tropic of Cancer, so first the sun rays will be overhead over southern part of India. Then slowly they are moving towards Tropic of Cancer. So if it is the main month, if it is the hottest month of North India, then it will be at least one month before or some means the month or time has to be before that the period we see the hottest month in North India. So it must be somewhat April. So we're getting this signal means sun rays overhead over a place, hottest time of that place. Yes, given that you find uh, climatic seasons, climate and seasons, you find their uh, topic. Second point, in western and southern regions, the hottest month is April. In northern regions, May is the hottest month. Post monsoon seasons in October to December, the rainfall occurs in southern part of India, in Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh coastal regions. The retreating monsoon, northeast monsoon, they produce rainfall in these months. But northern part of India, almost cloudless you find almost no rain or very little one <coughs> sorry so once they're cloudless if you try to recall in the study from the forest state of forest report by forest survey of india which months remains the months when the mapping of the forest cover is done the best months what are those months? October to December. Why? No rainfall, cloudless. Do you remember? It's given there. So you can see how they're relating these things. So no, so it's a geographical question. It can come in that way as well, in assertion reasoning portion as well. The next paragraph. So keep on tick marking or keep on just highlighting these points or your friend won't, hasn't given the permission to do it. <laughs> you see the Himalayan states, okay, two additional seasons we have apart from these autumn and spring. Now how many seasons traditionally do we have? So Indians have, we have six seasons. It's given there. So from that perspective the question can come, you should remember all the seasons, the name of the seasons, where we, uh, Vasant, Grisham, 
वर्षा शरद हेमंत शिशिर सो वसंत स्प्रिंग सीजन सो जस्ट बिफोर समर सो वसंत देन ग्रीष्म ग्रीष्म द ओल दीज आर संस्कृत वर्ड्स देन वर्षा मीन्स मानसून रेनफॉल शरद अर्ली ऑटम हेमंत लेट ऑटम शिशिर इज अ विंटर कम टू नेक्स्ट फ्लोरा सो इंडिया इज रैंक टेंथ पोजिशन इन द वर्ल्ड एंड फोर्थ इन एशिया इन द प्लांट डाइवर्सिटी नाउ द नेक्स्ट पैराग्राफ टॉक्स अबाउट एट डिस्टिंक्ट फ्लोरिस्टिक रीजन्स सो वट आर द एट डिस्टिंक्ट फ्लोरिस्टिक रीजन्स वेस्टर्न हिमालयाज ईस्टर्न हिमालयाज असम Indus Plain, Ganga Plain, Deccan, Malabar, and the Andamans. These are eight distinct floristic regions. So go through these uh, floristic regions once again. So there are eight floristic regions: Western Himalayas, Eastern Himalayas, Assam, Indus Plain, Ganga Plain, Deccan, Malabar, and Andamans. then bsi botanical survey of india that record last line read the last line this red data book the endangered plants they are listed into this red data book do you see the last line of this yes what is no no the whole maybe it's on the next page last time the whole to- of this topic flora okay in the same way yeah it so it includes both plants and animals okay faunal resources the next one is the faunal resources flora the plants faunal fauna means the animals so here we find the classification according to world Ge- biogeographical way so india represents two of the major realms which two realms are in india palearctic and indomalayan so you should remember that these are two major realms that are in india that india represents which are these two palearctic and indomalayan so where the palearctic where the palearctic is it is a uh, it it constitutes asia europe and somewhat northern part of africa in asia it leaves south asia and south east asia yeah so it includes northern part of this say from jammu and kashmir to himalayan region all these comes part so this is the way palearctic and the portion of asia that is left by palearctic that is in indomalayan okay so southern part south of the palearctic in asia it lies the indomalayan so these are two major realms as per biogeographic classification now there are three biomes as well and see the biomes humid forest tropical humid forest tropical dry deciduous forest warm desert semi deserts so three major biomes tropical humid desert humid forest tropical dry deciduous forest and warm desert or semi deserts now wildlife institute of india it has uh, somewhat modified view of classification that includes 10 biogeographic regions so you can go through them once if you remember them well and fine no then i then you can leave it now 
one of the line given there you find that within that india though it constitutes around 2% like around 2 and 1/2% around some are 2% of the world total land surface area but it has more than 7 and 1/2% around 7 and 1/2% of the species of animals worldwide and important thing in this is that of all the animals that india has more than 60% around 65% are the insects so around if 92000 species india has of animals then 61000 are insects alone so around 65% around are the insects so from environment perspective you should remember this now come to next census so census you can expect equations from census definitely because they haven't asked some questions from census before but it becomes very important so this year they can ask questions from census because the uh, the data wasn't available in full the problem data had come up only now you see the importance of census this first the second line so what the census does so it reveals the abundant human resource available in our country definitely how because it it counts the people in our country and the literacy rate okay the demography the proportion the proportion the culture and the economic structure so even the culture see it signifies it reveals the culture as well the importance of census so this census is 15 census of india since 1872 okay then you should know when the census happened in which uh, vice roy which governor general's time 1872 census which yeah which governor general's time the census the first census when they happened so go through that whether uh, litton ripon or mayo okay then you find certain uh, figures in the census the density density in 2011 is 382 so difference of 17.5% that has increased sex ratio 943 so the highest sex ratio since 1991 then literacy so literacy 73% now definition is important who are the literates so is it 7 and above so it's a specifically you don't find much about year 7 in different data or categories but once how do you find a person literate or not as per government of india so at least 7 and above can read and write and understand in any of the languages now this one is written somewhere below okay once we come to the topic of literacy separate but aged 7 and above it's written there can you see that uh fourth point the bullet marks yes literate constitutes 73% of total population aged 7 and above yeah. then come to next population so though on the world surface we are more than some or 2% but second largest population that we have we <laughs> feel proud of this population that single largest population populous country we are and this population has kept on increasing from one census to other census except 11 to 21 during 11 21 period the population has declined do you see the reason for it you see the population of india has as recorded at each decennial census from 1901 has grown steadily except for a decrease during 1911-21 census so during this census the population has declined so it can come up as assertion reasoning they can give the statement then can they can give somewhat a logic 
is this uh, explanation correct explanation for the statement or not so try to guess it out what could have been the reason for that come on 11 20 you are talking about 1911 21 <laughs> try to remember history from history try to recall this region this period was period of what what was the major uh, events that happened during this period world war first world war first world war wasn't the first world war there yes right and during the first world war and many other war time uh, miseries it led to the famine in india one of the largest famine in india it was during this period so this was the major reason for the decline in population now come to next in population density so what do you find the density in population increase for every state and uts now largest density state is bihar this becomes an important question because it has displaced west bengal from the top position so <laughs> bihar is the people are working very hard they have uh, left behind west bengal as the highest state highest populous state so as the figure has changed it was west bengal in the 2001 census maximum density population density okay so bihar has become the state with highest population density highest population is up but bihar with the maximum density of population from child sex ratio again very important question can come up you should remember this from the mains as well how much the child sex ratio uh, that we have that is 1919 no so onness 1919 per 1000 male so child sex ratio so it has declined again and which is which state is the most poorly performing state in terms of the child sex ratio state is the worst performing state in terms of child haryana correct so mahendragarh and jharjhar districts these are the two worst performing districts as well so it becomes a uh, way of discussion as well though on one side haryana punjab these states are economically well performing states so on one side uh, what the various economists or various people they suggest once economically once people they grow economically sex ratio should improve but we are finding the sex ratio has declined in the well developing areas so it brings it in other areas of discussion so what could have been the other reasons so that becomes from the main perspective the discussion now come to the literacy again you find who is a literate person in india is it 7 and above can both read and write with understanding in any language is literate kerala you know as always it has retained its position number 1 then lakshadweep bihar again the worst performing state that ranks last in the country so bihar maximum density of population in literacy last one effective literacy rate again kerala lakshadweep then mizoram bihar anachal rajasthan the worst performing states now there are certain tables again the same things you can find the top one just how much the various growth decadal growth so more than 17% so just a round about figure you can remember page number 6 come to page number 6 right we find decadal growth table there is table different is it so <laughs> which page uh, do you find a table of uh, sex ratio density and decadal growth of population so 
decadal growth 17.64 so just remember certain data of this just whatever we have highlighted those things we just need to remember that's it So go through these information once. So we see in the literacy come back, uh, come in the literacy once again. Okay, now come to the next. Next chapter. Hmm. Population density. Yeah, Delhi is not state. Delhi is UT. You see that first state below this below this UT you find what state? That is Bihar will be the top state. So it is NC to Delhi at number one, then Chandigarh at number two, then in Puducherry I think, no? Yeah. These are UTs which are definitely small area, more people living, so you can easily find out. You just go out go outside in Delhi. You keep, you just feel like striking people here and there. <laughs> and come to next chapter. Chapter number two, that is polity or national symbol. National symbol we have. Okay, fine. So flag. So flag first. It showcases a flag. Okay. Before this emblem, yes, before this emblem, one page before this emblem, flag. Okay, so flag, how the dimension of flag, in what proportion, what ratio? Two is the width, three is the height, two is to three. Saffron, white, green, you know this. See the state emblem. Emblem, you can find three lines. One chakra, chakra has been taken from uh, Sarnath. This whole, in fact, the state emblem is taken from the Sarnath line of Ashoka capital. Then you find bull. You see that's the first state emblem. See the figure, the, uh, the figure there. Three lines you can see from the front. Then uh, chakra. Then you can find one horse, galloping horse. Then bull. So it has been taken in original. Uh, the original one is the Sarnath line capital of Ashoka. In the original there are four lines standing back to back. Then what are other animals in the Sarnath line capital of Ashoka? One elephant. So two you can see. That is a horse, galloping horse and the bull. Other ones? Elephant and then a lion. Okay. Now they are carved out of a single block of polish and stone. So the same block that has been carved out and as in form this emblem. Then you can see the chakra is a wheel of low it showcased. Even you see the dharam chakra, dharam chakra parivartan is a stages of the Buddha. So how so different symbols in the initial uh, sects of Buddha you find Hinyan. So these people they don't use to represent Buddha in the terms of images. By way of symbols they use. Sorry? Mahayana. Then what is in the Buddhism? In Jainism you have no no. <laughs> in Jainism you have Shvetangar Digangar. Okay, Mahayana, Hinyan. These are yeah. These are these are uh, the you know the monks of the Buddha. 
So they were divided into different one. Ones as a period that kept on following. So the initial one, they were Hinayans. Once they are following the strict principles of the Buddhism, then slowly they get relaxed. Okay, they used to uh, let the lavish lifestyle. They used to drink as well, having liquor, having even they started eating the non non vegetarian. They started allowing the women as well into the. So it was become Mahayan, larger wheel, smaller wheel. That is the Hinayan. So the, you find Hinayan people, they, the monks, the Buddhist, they they didn't believe in the uh, images of Buddha. So wherever you find the Hinayan uh, kind of the images where it represents those, you find the symbols. Symbols, for example, tree, people tree. You find, say, this Dharam Chakrat Parivartan, or say, uh, lotus, or somewhat you know seat, uh, the, the you know empty seat as well. So there uh, is a major difference, you know, one of the difference. Come below. So when the state emblem was adopted, 26 January 1950, it was adopted on our Republic Day, the state emblem. You also find written there, Satyamyo Jayate from Mundaka Upanishad. So you can find on your state emblem, Satyamyo Jayate is written there. We find in the emblem, Below, written in the Hindi, Satyamyo Jayate. Right? So the question the UPC asked in the last uh, last year, last last year, from where the Satyamyo Jayate has been adopted from Mundaka Upanishad. So these kind of things, facts are given directly into. So you can say it has come from history, or you can say it has come from India book. Whatever the way you like. Then you find here national flag. You have seen national flag, so we have flag code of India and before that we have another act as well that is governed by the provisions of emblem and names provisions of improper use act 1950 now even though you don't remember these but what you can remember that these uh, flag code of India even this has a provisions which implements the provisions of the certain act so these uh, rules regulations code these are statutory in nature it's not something only resolution certain directions these come from the parliament come below national anthem which is our national anthem Jangan Man composed originally in Bengali by Ravindranath Tagore and adopted in Hindi version as National Anthem of India on January 24, 1950. So you see just two days before, two days before we adopted state emblem. So state emblem was adopted on 26 January 1950, National Anthem 24 January 1950. So they may not ask directly exact date but they may ask in chronological order which one has been adopted earlier. In what way? So it is anthem first, then state emblem. Okay. Now another important thing: first sung in 1911 Kolkata session of Indian National Congress. So it is again important. So it was first sung when in Kolkata session of INC when 1911 session. All right. Then come to next one: national song. National song Vande Matram, composed in Sanskrit by Bankim Chandra Chatterjee. So it was one of the source of inspiration for people while fighting for the freedom struggle. Okay, so many times we found the people shouting. You know, while read the books, people were shouting like uh, of Vande Matram. Okay, so from this they were getting the inspiration. It was a source of inspiration for the people to fight against the Britishers. Then what do you find? It is given the equal status with Jan Ganman. So nothing, it's equal status. No, nobody is superior or the inferior. First sung in 1896 session of Indian National Congress. So again it can come up question, okay, which was sung earlier? It was first Vande Matram, then it was Jan Ganman. Moreover, if you remember during uh, 
1905 when Bengal partition happened and in the Savdeshi Andolan. So Vande Matram became very popular, right? So how you can get Vande Matram? Because it was first sung in 1896 session. So it was there, but you didn't have the Janganman during this time. So even the question can come up, okay, Janganman was the popular slogan during Savdeshi Andolan statement. It is incorrect statement because Janganman was first sung during 1911 session. It was not there before 1911. Maybe it could have been somewhat uh, or uh, it could have been a source of inspiration in certain other uh, Andolans after that but not, def not, be not definitely before that. So just have the relatively you just link them and question if, if it comes. So try to get it analytically. Next one, national calendar. So based on Sakaira, Chetra, its first month question has come up before as well. Chetra starts when? Chetra is the first month. So the question comes the first month of Sakaira, Chetra. The question has been asked earlier by UPSC and it is not as in the long before ago but in the last couple of years only. So they ask the question like this. Now it can be question you can say from culture, from history, whatever, but it is there in the in the first eight ten pages of India book only. So March twenty second being the first one. Adopted on twenty March twenty second, nineteen fifty seven. So first Chetra, Chetra one on March twenty second. In case of leap year, it is March twenty first. Just remember March 22nd starts the Chetra in case of normal years. So national calendar adopted in 1957. If you compare these, calendar 57, national song first sung in 1896, national anthem first sung 11 adopted on 50 and State emblem 50, 26 January. So, and this one national flag adopted by Constituent Assembly July 22, 1947. So, what do you find this national calendar is the one that has been adopted after all these in 57. Sakaira 78 AD. Okay, if you remember the Kushanas, Kanesh. They started the Sakaira. If you read the history book there, you can find it. Okay. Sakaira 78 AD. So, however, different uh, historians they claim differently, but this is one of the fact or this is one of the uh, views by the various historian, and that is also given in our NCRT books. We come to the next chapter, polity chapter. Polity chapter, though we have a very uh, magnificent book that is Lakshmi Kant for UPSC preparation. Okay. <coughs> but still, I will recommend to read this not only once, two, three times. So you can read these around 30, 40 pages, two, three times within three, four hours, three hours maximum, three, four, four hours maximum. But you cannot read like whole Lakshmi Kant, the whole Lakshmi Kant in three, four hours. Okay. So I am not suggesting you to not read Lakshmi Kant, read the Lakshmi Kant two, three times, but read this as well. Why? Because if it taking the last minute revision, then time will come and you will read this polity from the India book within say half an hour. And within this half an hour, I guarantee you five questions will come. Now I am not just say, saying something that is uh, ideal in nature, it is practically I am saying because if I have, even I didn't, I, I didn't used to read India book, so uh, say the polity portion, 
But when I read it once, I found the question even from the first paragraph. You see the second paragraph of this, it says what, somewhere in the middle, the highlighted portion, the council of minister is collectively responsible to the house of people, Lok Sabha. Do you find this line? Lok Sabha. This statement directly came in UPSC question paper, IS question paper. Which of the following statements are correct statement? To the council of ministers collected responsible to whom? To the Lok Sabha. It is a correct statement. Many other questions they had come up earlier directly from the India book quality portion. So you, either you can uh, understand them they have come from the Lakshmi Khand or from the India book, it is up to you. But why I say it is important because by reading the less yeah, static. Yes. I don't remember all the questions that it, that had come earlier, but once I read it, the whole, then I found it's very much important. Many questions can come, more than five, six questions that can come up from this chapter alone. So read all these, no need to leave anything, if I uh, need to leave anything, I will just let you know, keep on uh, just moving forward, come to president. Okay, what topics, even though you need to read the whole, the everything in uh, polity that is given in Lakshmi Kant or certain other books that you are reading, but still you can figure it out which topic remains more important. So that you can give extra focus on those topics, those topics you can note it down that I think are important as per they had been in the news. So you can note down those topics that you need to read, at least read those in detail. <coughs> so if we go chapter by chapter, let's see, in fundamental rights, which right has been in news more or that has been there. One of the very uh, major issue had been regarding the sedition case, the GNU issue if you remember. So there has been a controversy over this that the students demanded they had the freedom of speech and expression that was being curbed. So article 19.1a becomes important. So Article 191A is the freedom of speech and expression. Until what extent this freedom is allowed? So means the reasonable restrictions as well. We need to remember around seven or eight. I think eight reasonable restrictions are there. So you need to go through all those reasonable restrictions. So the question can come up: Which of the following are the reasonable restrictions given in our Constitution over Article 191A or freedom of speech and expression? So this will be the relevant question as these had been in controversy. So certain reason, reasonable restrictions like sovereignty, security of our state, okay, friendly relation with the foreign nations, decency and morality, then public order, incitement to offense, contempt to court. These are certain reasonable restrictions. So go through all the reasonable restrictions given in your policy book. You need to remember exactly what they are because they, the, the option may be very close one. Then what else you can expect in the first, in the freedom, freedom, uh, this fundamental right chapter. Then right to reputation, article 21, that is again important. Okay, first we talk about uh, first we talk about this only. Okay, right to information uh, is it a fundamental right? Is it given the status of fundamental right? Right to information. We have the act, but here it is also given the status of fundamental right. As per the interpretation of the Supreme Court, no, Article 19 
is given the status of fundamental right under article 191a you see right to freedom of speech and expression how supreme court has explained this thing it has said that unless you unless you don't have right to get the proper right information how you can express yourself freely and correctly so to ensure you express your expression is as per the proper reasonable knowledge you need to have right to get information from the government so this right to information is given the status of the fundamental right right to reputation right to reputation right to reputation under article 21 why it is in the news recently supreme court has discussed about it okay regarding defamation cases criminal defamation by hearing while hearing the cases of criminal defamation supreme court said it has given the weight as a right to the it has given weight as to right to reputation it said right to reputation is a fundamental right so the question can come up directly again okay what else insert another important news that had been there in the last some months you may have found about uh, defection a lot of cases regarding so these sudden uh, things you can read from the polity perspective regarding the emergency specifically the presidential rule read in detail presidential rule very important all the aspects in such a way that you remember each and everything about the presidential rule each and everything i say from the lakshmi kant from the book you read it in detail i won't take up this portion again because it will consume our time you have done it in the class many times okay so read this again then another controversy or issue had been regarding the defection we had seen in both cases arunachal first and then in uttarakhand so both the states where first presidential rule was imposed and the position part and the <coughs> ruling party had with the help of speaker had disqualified in fact the speaker disqualified the defecting members so regarding anti defection what rule do we have in which schedule which schedule schedule 10 okay fine and the schedule 10 was added by which amendment act by 52nd constitution amendment act you need to remember this they have asked earlier about the schedule that anti defection comes under which schedule or schedule 10 talks about what so you should know so they may not ask directly the same schedule they may ask about which amendment act so it is 52nd constitution amendment act then you should know under which circumstances the member can be disqualified under which circumstances no no it is something if the if the person leaves the party member is a member of the house leaves the party join another party okay yeah independent one so you can say the independent member joins any party or any nominated member joins the party after 6 months okay so you can uh, remember all these things the various provisions moreover <coughs> 
so diffraction becomes important okay who is the final which which is the final authority having a final say in the diffraction disqualification speaker if the statement comes uh, the power to disqualify a member of legislature lies with the speaker only is it correct or in yeah so the, is the statement is correct or not no why because many of us will think okay speaker definitely speaker is to have the final say in the disqualification of the member yes if the member is the member of lok sabha or vidhan sabha but what if the member of legislature is member of the rajya sabha or legislative council then it is chairman so it means in short term it is presiding officer which has a final say in the disqualification of the member based over defection comes under judicial review yes it comes under scope of judicial review now what other uh, topics remains important so you, we have taken this okay yeah frivolous motion yes so this becomes important and uh, you may even find discrepancy in the book as well because uh, the question can come up the frivolous motion okay frivolous motion is brought when or uh, is brought in what case when there is breach of frivolous of the member of breach of frivolous of the house or a member or any committee thereof so in case of breach of frivolous of any of these of house of member or any or any committee thereof in that case this motion can be brought against whom okay, when, when it is believed that breach of parliament has been breach of frivolous of parliament breach of frivolous of the house when in case if a, somebody uh, hides certain facts or reveals certain wrong information and it is assumed that it is breach of frivolous of the parliament or any of the house now against whom it can be brought this is the area of gray area where you don't have exact clarity why i say because in the book if you see read lakshmi kant you find it said against minister only it is said there but what i believe now it is not the correct statement there because if you read if you go through the rules of procedure of the house there it doesn't classify any it doesn't distinguish even it doesn't say against whom it can be brought so if doesn't distinguishly say something so it means it can be brought against anybody any member whether minister or not yeah and we find the real example as when the budget session started the first day it was brought against smriti rani the very next day the bjp people they brought this frivolous motion against one of the congress member i think jyotirudas sindhya is the person against whom this frivolous motion was brought so just go through try to recall certain important events that had happened with respect to our polity portion go through them it says minister so you need to rectify that thing only uh, most of the things are correct in lakshmi kant only if you find some word uh, description one this is one and another is where it talks about how to remove a vice president sorry yeah, yeah how to remove a vice president or any uh, any presiding officer of the house yeah there it says that absolute majority but that is incorrect yes but if you see go through the constitution it says majority of the then members of the house it means who are the members at that time you need to subtract the vacancies so it comes the effective majority go through these uh, all the portion you just i won't go through them again
does speaker uh, does term of speaker is is term of speaker coterminous with the term of Lok Sabha? Uh, yes, correct. So he will continue holding the position as uh, just before the new speaker is elected. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Har ek har ek the major means the important points, every important point you will find it here. Is delegated legislation subject to review and control by parliament? Yes. Delegated legislation. What is delegated le legislation? Yes, delegate means to whom? To the government generally. Because in a way the legislation, the law, the law is uh, passed by the parliament. The power or the passing, so it doesn't describe each and every minute rules and regulation. So those become part of the delegated legislation and that work is given to the, in fact, the bureaucracy or the government, executives in fact. So they take care of that. But it doesn't mean they take care, means it doesn't take away the powers of parliament, the legislature to look over the monitor those delegated legislation. Because the delegated legislation should, as an overall should come under the broad principles of that law that has been passed. It should not go beyond that law or in somehow come in conflict with that, the original law. Because those are only part of that. So it says there, I don't know which page number is it because in the ebook it doesn't showcase the page number. Well, uh, we come to uh, keep on uh, flipping over the pages. You see the functions and powers of parliament. The topic, functions and powers of parliament. Yeah, after, after, sorry, yeah, after, uh, you see, after Lok Sabha, you'll see the parliament, you see the legislature, in legislature you have Rajya Sabha, you have Lok Sabha, you have function power of the parliament, then certain table you have, you see just below the table there is point one, under article 94, in case of dissolution of Lok Sabha speaker, yeah, just below below that, the next page. Yes, next page. Point. First point. Yeah. So very minute and very important information they have given in this. Now come the paragraph below this after eighteen point. What do you find there? Delegated legislation. All legislation required consent of both houses of parliament in case of money bills, however, the bill of blocks were prevails. Now, delegated legislation is also subject to review and control by parliament. Okay, so even with the delegated legislation, parliament has the power to review and control. Now, various parliamentary committees are given. Okay, now these committees question has come up on these committees, standing committee, the estimates, public accounts, public undertaking, then departmental related standing committees, the purpose of DRC, how many 24 departmental related standing committees we have, right? So these committees in fact provide a financial control, as a, they work as a tool of financial control by parliament over the executives. So they consider demand for grants, you see in the budget, the budget has certain steps. One of the steps is regarding this de uh, departmental led standing committees. Now the budget is given to these one and they uh, consider the whole one in detail and make a report so that uh, ultimately the member of parliament, they can understand what is there in the budget. because. Many people are layman people in parliament, so they may not understand the technicalities of that. So to help them to understand and so that to help them in effective discussion of the budget as well. Then you can find leader of opposition parliament. Leader of opposition parliament, next. Come next to next page, you find it. So, we have seen it had been controversy last year or uh, 
when the government came into power last last year and in uh, Delhi Assembly as well in uh, central government parliament as well so the opposition party had to had one tenth of the mem uh, seats in order to have this position okay but then it was uh, said okay fine leader of the largest opposition party we won't give the status of leader of opposition but because this leader of opposition it is given the statutory status you see here so this is the leaders of opposition Rajasthan Lok Sabha has accorded statutory recognition just remember this thing that's it then come to CAG CAG again becomes important this year keep on uh, CAG go through CAG okay the complete on what the actual task is how CAG is removed how is appointed the removal the grounds of removal the way the uh, Supreme Court High Court is removed the same way CAG is removed by the president why CAG important this year you have seen the former CAG Vinod Rai he had been appointed the he has been appointed chairman of complete complete me Vinod Rai has been appointed what head of what chairman of Bank yes, yes, Bank Board Bureau, Bank. correct. Because uh, to maintain the independence, that there are certain restrictions that post retire, post uh, this office, they cannot take any office under central government, state government, or any other remedy of office under any either of the government. So it came into controversy during this time. Cabinet Secretariat, so Cabinet Secretariat. Ex officio chairman, cabinet secretary is the ex officio chairman of civil service board. So, how this can help? This can help in the ones uh, cabinet secretary. So, what the, per, what the function of cabinet secretary is? So, she is the head of the civil service board, ex officio chairman of civil service board. He is the senior most civil servant, he is supposed to be the source of power to the all the civil, serv civil servants in India. So he is supposed to be the senior most. Okay. So he can the one of the function of cabinet secretariat is uh, coordinating the various cabinet meetings and uh, all those meetings of the cabinet and taking care of that. Moreover, interministerial coordination it is another task of cabinet secretary, cabinet secretariat. Now come to the various departments. Okay, tell me a certain question before we go further. Uh, Department of State comes under which ministry? Of State. Yes. Department of State. Okay. Department of State. I give you certain options. Okay. Uh, Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare, Ministry of Rural Development, Ministry of Home, Ministry of Culture. It comes under Ministry of Home Affairs, Department of Language, Home Affairs, Department of Internal Security, Home Affairs, Border Management, Home Affairs. So these are important ones. Now, what? whatever, yeah, yeah, it does. In fact, but it department comes under this uh, Ministry of Home Affairs. Basically, I, I suppose the uh, the you see Interstate Council. Have you heard about it? So, Journal Council, Interstate Council. Again, Journal Council comes under what? Ministry of Home Affairs. It does what? More interaction, more coordination among different states. The same way, I believe. The same task would have been entrusted to the Department of State as well. Now come to certain ministry, Ministry of Finance we see first. Only a few ministries you need to go through. Come to Ministry of Finance. Now various ministries and the departments are given. It is given 17 number at serial number 17, Ministry of Finance. 
in the same page you could see Nain Pradesh Jab. And these are the number of ministries are given. At number 17 you have Ministry of Finance. And there are five departments. Important these are Department of Economic Affairs, Expenditure, Revenue, Disinvestment, Financial Services. Now Department of Economic Affairs, Expenditure, okay fine. Uh, which department prepares the budget? The question can come up. Which, which department? Department of Economic Affairs. Right. Now this department in fact is responsible for the major policy, economic policy making decisions. So budget or any other major economic policy are decided by this Department of Economic Affairs. Department Revenue, what comes in this? The various uh, departments which generate revenue for the government. For example, income tax, central excise and customs, ED also comes under this. Then you have Department of Disinvestment. Now, this department has been renamed now. In this budget, if you remember, they said DPM, Department of Investment and Public Asset Management. Department of Investment and Public Asset Management. Come to next page and next one, uh, 21, serial number 21, you find Ministry of Home Affairs. See, Internal Security, Department of States, Official Language, German Kashmir Affairs, Border Management, Department of Home, all these are departments under Ministry of Home Affairs. So just remember these two ministries, that's all. And come to next to next. Come to performance related incentives. For mains you can uh, write it. Okay. So in uh, ethics paper or somewhere in GS paper 2 if the with the governance or increasing efficiency in the governance the question comes. So there you can refer that even the six pay commission had recommended the performance related incentive because you, uh, you can logically analyze as well because if you give the incentives, it can enhance the performance. That this is the only thing you need to remember. That's it for mains perspective. Next, operationalizing Sevottam. Sevottam, we'll discuss it uh, further. It is regarding the citizen charters and client charters. Seva, it is made of two terms, Seva and Uttam. So means Uttam Seva, excellent service delivery. Sevottam, service excellence. Now come to uh, National Authority Chemical Weapons Convention. Okay, so this National Authority Chemical Weapons Convention. What's the purpose of this? This authority was set up by resolution of Cabinet Secretariat. So this authority is not is not uh, given any. Uh, initially was not given any uh, statutory act but parliament later enacted it so now we have the chemicals weapons convention act as well so this authority is interested with the task to fulfill obligation enunciated in chemical weapons convention okay so chemical weapons conventions it prohibits now this prohibits development production execution transfer use and stockpiling of all chemical weapons by member states in a non-discriminatory manner. So means all types of chemical weapons, there are certain restrictions are imposed over them. Their production, transportation, carrying or uh, export, import, like all these are given there. So we have another act, parliament enacted the act in 2000, read the last paragraph. Last paragraph is again important. National authority is responsible for implementing of CWC Act, that is Chemical Weapons Convention Act, in liaison with the OPCW, that is what Organization for Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. Okay, it is an international organization, and it came into limelight with its role in Syria. Okay, by finding out the various and Bashar al-Assad also allowed this OPCW to come and in Syria. 
and plays role regarding the assessment monitoring of the various chemical weapons used in Syria and it all it was also accorded acclaim worldwide for its contribution there and moreover it was also awarded Nobel Peace Prize in 2013 so it can become important regarding that way OPCW so from Indian perspective perspective the question can come up that which authority which authority do we have to comply to the various to the uh, chemical weapons convention we have national authority chemical weapons convention and is mandated to perform tasks under act we have chemical weapons convention act 2000 so it is statutory it derives the power statutorily so you can see there opcw 2013 Nobel Peace Prize for its work in Syria. Which chemical weapon used in Syria? Sarin. Disaster management. These next two uh, topics. These are for mains perspective. You can remember them. And uh, so for the disaster management, man management even the question can be regarding disaster management response force in the prelims they want to come. So various paramilitary forces are involved in the disaster management response force. Basically, for mains, it is more important. Come to keep on coming now. We have grievance redress. Grievance redress, you find a centralized public grievance redress and monitoring system. The topic name is Grievance Redress. Do you find that? Grievance re Redress. Right. Just remember the name. We have one of the way tool that is Centralized Public Grievance Redress and Monitoring System. So on the portal we have, so any person having the grievances, any the government service or whatever, he can lose the complaint for and the grievance would be redressed. So again you can use this as an information while in uh, case study in ethics paper because we have some more administrative ethics and all in uh, GS paper 4. Come next. Public service delivery, Sevottam, is very important for the mains, specifically GS paper 4 ethics paper. So Sevottam means Seva and Uttam, means Uttam Seva service excellence so now till now what had been our the how the mindset of government had been while uh, going for service and all it had been more about the administration and control when you more talk about administration and controlling the people and whatever way you're trying to more impose more, you're trying to concentrate more and more power so it means in your mind the people are not the center stage you are more concerned about your powers and how to control the people. But Sevotta means service. The main purpose is delivering service. Now who are the recipient of service? The citizens. So they are to be empowered. So they are, now citizens are made at the center stage. So citizen empowerment it is. How the citizen empowerment will happen? By your citizen charter. So Sevotta is also be by citizen charter way so in citizen charter the various things will be disclosed for example it has to describe all the services so every department will have its own citizen charter in this citizen charter every department need to list all the services it is to provide because many times if they don't have citizen charter and people they even they are dismayed and even they don't know this service is to get from which department so they had to run from pillar to post they don't know anything you may have seen the uh, uh, office office at one time that used to come okay because people they don't they didn't have the information once people they have the knowledge their information that this department is to give this service next in this department now this service is to be given by within what time period and who is the per person 
responsible to give this service and in case service is not delivered what how the grievance redressal would be done where the complaint would be lodged so means everything is there so citizen would know okay this is a way yeah this is a person this is a particular authority where who is to be approached for this delivery of service for getting this service so now once citizens have more information they can pressurize the government pressurize the administration and they can keep the uh, government officials on their toes always ready to provide the services and to improve the efficiency and effectiveness in those service delivery system so are you getting this thing so this remain very important from the so means wherever you find in the ways developed countries what actually is happening there why you have the low corruption in the various developed countries because citizens are empowered when everybody knows what his entitlement is what his right his or her right is and they know from where whom to approach in case they don't get the justice they don't get the service then whom to approach where to complain in india this remains a major problem major trouble that we don't even know these things and we don't know so means uh, restricted information and distorted information that in fact makes a citizen somewhat uh, shackled and doesn't allow the citizen to approach the government functionaries with demands and the rights what they have so the way how the citizens can be empowered so that they can demand their rights and entitlements so sevottam model is a model that deals with seva uttam means uttam seva so very uh, certain good points are given there only the first three paragraphs you can read In the first three paragraphs you can get the idea about the sevottam and even if the question can come up in ethics paper in ethics definitely you can write in different question different ways same way in uh, paper 2 as well if you need to enhance the governance you need to enhance the efficiency in governance or government because polity in governance is the gs paper 2 we have so again is the way how empower the citizens as say comes on corruption or whatever again is the way we come to next towards right based service delivery just remember name of the bill this bill was introduced in lok sabha was the name of bill rights right of citizens for time bound delivery of goods and services and redressal of their grievances bill 2011 but this bill couldn't pass through the parliament but it was introduced so if question come any suggestion how to improve the present system of the governance or service delivery you can propose this can be your suggestion that sir uh, this bill should be brought in and to be passed by the parliament see the heading of the bill name right of citizens for time bound delivery of goods and services and redressal of their grievance bill means every citizen now will have the legal right to get the delivery of goods and services in the time bound manner stipulated time manner and in case they don't get it grievance redressal second part is redressal of their grievances the so this bill can give the legal rights to the citizens it means in that case they can approach court as well or they can demand from the government directly but well, this is our right given by the parliament so just try to remember this bill for the mains perspective this is important not in the prelims <clears throat> come to next ibsa just i need to remember what ibsa signifies for again for mains for promoting good governance and wishing to strengthen south south cooperation you see the members of ibsa india brazil and south africa three countries basically somewhere in the southern part right 
so south south cooperation one thing is this the southern part of their uh, right so secondly it's about the good governance more about the governance this india brazil south africa foreign relations now it is losing its charm losing its significance even we don't hear much of the news regarding ibsa it is more about brics okay so how what kind of question you can expect in the mains you can find the relevance of ibsa is comparison with brics why I, ibsa is losing its uh, relevance in the contemporary uh, international scenario or comparing the brics how or brics outshining the ibsa comment so you should know first what ibsa why ibsa was formed in fact for what purpose what objective okay so in that regard you can discuss those so you can read from the again from mains perspective right information very important do you see right to information yeah. how is it important for mains ethics paper you have it a part of your syllabus is explicitly written there in gs paper 4 what is it written right to information act so every information question will come up you can use the information given this in dr book in gs paper 4 under right to information so try to read and understand after giving prelims abhi you don't I, I, at this time you just need to remember right information is statutory act as well as it is given the status of a fundamental right under article which article you're not listening right information is given the status of fundamental right under which article mm-hmm, 91 a freedom of speech and expression yes right to reputation hmm 21 to go through the rights given there in lakshmi kanda under article 21 and 191a administrative tribunals yes Do you see that? Yeah. Okay. So read this. What's the name of topic? Read the name of topic. Hmm. So Central Administrative Tribunal. Right, so you see, administrative tribunals under which article? Three twenty three A. Okay. So, what's the purpose of administrative tribunal? Purpose is what? Yeah, yeah speedy uh, grievance redressal mechanism. Say any government employee or is not happy with any government decision, whatever. So, the this tribunal acts as a speedy uh, disposal of the cases regarding the administrative cases where any person is having. Uh, grievances or any uh, issues regarding with respect to government decision or departmental decision or whatever they can approach administrative tribunal so you catch central administrative tribunal state administrative tribunal different tribunals we have so under 323a and 323b also talks about another kind of tribunal so the tribunals uh, 
नेक्स्ट इज इंटरस्टेट काउंसिल दिस अगेन इंपॉर्टेंट फ्रॉम लक्ष्मीकांत यू कैन रीड इट आर्टिकल टू सिक्सटी थ्री ओके द पर्पज ओके वन थिंग इज इट वॉज एस्टेब्लिश ऑन द रिकमेंडेशन ऑफ सरकारी या कमीशन ऑन सेंटर स्टेट रिलेशंस and through presidential order it was established so to get have a more better understanding more better coordination between the different states the interstate council is there to uh, inquire into the disputes between states as well it is also one of the way right now the supreme court is also having it also has the original jurisdiction to inquire into the, into the disputes to dis- decide of the disputes between state and the different states and the state like this there it takes only on the questions based over law here it is not specified to the law in fact and it is recommend it is a recommendatory in nature its recommendations are advisory in nature they won't be binding then read the states Our states here: the governor, powers of council of minister, legislative council. You can see legislative council is given. So, in legislative council, uh, you see that it comprises of not more than one third of the members in assembly of the state, and in no case forty members, and no case less than forty members. Do you get it? This was the question in the last year quality paper. one of the statement was given uh, that uh, i don't remember, i don't remember the statement exact statement but it was regarding the members of a legislative council what can be the strength of legislative council so it clearly given here that it cannot be more than one third of the total members and in no case less than 40 members you see this and under a council of minister legislature legislative council where are you after interstate council you have states we uh, do we have done the interstate council your states then you have legislature legislative council don't you find it bold topics yes legislative council is a topic name after interstate council so just uh, you need to read all of these in between you can skip you have seen certain topics in between you you could skip those easily but these are again important you can find these things then here uh, come to below before that before administrative tribunal you have another topic that is official language constitution statutory provisions before administrative tribunal official language only a couple of topics before that so article 3431 of constitution provides hindi in devanagari script shall be the official language of union and 343 through provides continuing the use of english in official work of union for a period of 15 years right then parliament enacted the law according to section then you can see now uh, it also empowered from date of commencement constitution article 343 it empowers parliament to provide by law for continued use of english for official purpose even after 25 january 1965 so do you see this thing until 1965 english was to continue to be used as a language for official work as official language but it gave the option for parliament to parliament even to continue after that by enacting any act so the parliament enacted a legislation for the continued use of the english as an official language 
So question can come up in either of the statement. You need to remember Hindi official language. Okay, fine. English. It uh, it it was made. It was extended by Parliament even after 1965. Okay, so this Act, Official Language Act, provides for the continued use of the English. Sorry. Yeah, for but states they can have their own official language. Now states, apart from uh, English or any, so they can have any any of the official language. So who decides? The president decide over that. if a substantial portion of the population of uh, that state if they want it if they uh, they speak that language that can be done that's all from polity chapter so the middle portion where it's more about the administration and uh, other things those portion can leave they would automatically come to know the importance of certain uh, portion which are not important and rest you read it okay now we come to the next chapter that is agriculture so agriculture even in this budget our government has given a lot of focus <coughs> more focus on agriculture and the rural development so our government our finance minister in the budget has said that we need to move from we we just not we just not to look over food security but also go for the income security of the farmers and our budget annually says to double the farmers income in the coming 5 uh, 7 years so government launched various scheme policies now this india book won't talk about the budgetary initiatives because it had already been published by the time budget came okay now it includes the schemes which had been there in the last year till december month these schemes have been included apart from other schemes we had done in the yojana or certain budget yojana or in newspapers so certain schemes you can add up apart from india book as per our class discussion Now you see in agriculture use. Now you have uh, an umbrella scheme, that is, krishi onati. Means krishi ki onati. Development of agriculture. So it's an umbrella scheme. It includes many other schemes within this umbrella scheme. One is National Food Security Mission. The National Food Security Mission commercial crops, which three commercial crops. cotton jute and sugar cane we need to remember these the mission for integrated development of horticulture and finally national mission for sorry national mission on oil and oil seeds and oil palms and national mission for sustainable agriculture Just keep on going in a b c d e so these are the schemes that comes under krishi unity yojana So understand, Krishi Unity Yojana is an umbrella scheme, which has many other schemes within this. There is no such a separate scheme, Krishi Unity. There are several schemes which come under the Krishi Unity Yojana. What are those schemes? Five schemes are those. You see, Food Security Mission, then Food National Food Security Mission for commercial crops, which three commercial crops comes under this? Cotton, jute, and sugar cane. Correct. then what is next one oil oil seeds and palms uh, national mission on sustainable agriculture then mission for integrated development of horticulture so these are five schemes that comes under krishi unity yojana now we go the c one by one if anything 
apart from this now come to c mission c that is mission for integrated development of horticulture so it is important you can find so importance of agriculture chapter is for both prelims and mains in prelims they can ask the scheme directly in mains you can use these schemes in the various answer writing or in the in the in the essay paper as well now see this one mission for integrated development of horticulture now it again subsumes another missions okay so now it includes national horticulture mission horticulture mission for northeast and himalayan states national bamboo mission and three central sector schemes that is national horticulture board coconut development board and central institute of horticulture nagaland so all these come under mission for integrated development of horticulture the question can come up directly if it comes a uh, national horticulture board so you won't find like how a board can be part of this uh, mission for integrated development horticulture but it is even it is given in economic survey all right so go through that try to remember just go through it once right now and uh, let me know what are these national horticulture mission national bamboo mission and then three yellow that is horticulture board national horticulture board coconut development board and central institute of horticulture nagaland next one national mission on oil seeds and oil palms then we have national mission for sustainable agriculture read this sustainable agriculture it's very important one so to have a more sustainable and climate resilient agriculture cultivation practices in our country so you see uh, because of climate change global warming extreme weather extreme weather events so they affect the agriculture in adverse manner in terms of the available water in our soils or in our aquifers moreover uh, about the fertility of soil certain areas so all these things in one way or other way they affect the agriculture so how national mission system agriculture is going to work so to make so mitigate adaptation for both it will be adopted mitigation and adaptation of and making the agriculture more climate resilient so the any changes comes first of all limit the change if any change comes then make our agriculture system adapt adapted to the changes in climate so this mission is part of as one of the mission of eight missions that comes under national action plan on climate change do you remember those eight missions so npcc national action plan on climate change it has eight missions what are those eight missions so when we have the you told national mission for sustainable agriculture national water mission then national solar mission then national mission for green india then fifth sustainable habitat sixth announced national mission for the national mission will come up in each and every term okay so 
the national mission for enhanced energy efficiency seventh national mission for himalayan ecosystem eighth national mission for development of strategic knowledge to combat climate change these are eight missions that come under npcc so one of the mission is national mission on sustainable agriculture now regarding the national mission on sustainable agriculture what else we can include you can include say uh, because what this mission talks about it talks about bringing the various sustainable agriculture practices making them prevalent in our country making the farmers aware about those and even in certain areas farmers are themselves practicing those traditional agriculture practices we had seen in the northeast seas now how various traditional agriculture practices the farmers are practicing and those are environmentally sustainable as well so to promote and flourish those so we have in this you can even the mains you can use an example in prelims also the question can come up geographic geographically important agriculture heritage sites what this giahs means giahs yes correct so fao food and agriculture organization it make list of various geographically it recognizes the geographically important agriculture heritage sites so in india there are three sites which comes under this which three sites we've done it earlier try to recall there are three sites under geographically important agriculture heritage one is in kerala that is kuttanad yes yes very good so below sea level rice cultivation means even in the salty water they have adopted certain practices that makes them to grow rice there so below sea level rice cultivation in kerala kuttanad second koraput that is in odisha third in pampor pampor in jammu and kashmir do you remember pampor so tell me yes good saffron and what is the speciality lotilis lotilis saffron cultivation I can now come to the next one soil health card scheme soil health card like we have done it many times soil health card now what the soil health card will do it is card that will tell the farmers about the state of health of the soil and in what way what proportion the fertilizers to be mixed the nutrients so present nutrient level of the soil and it helps in the judicious use of the fertilizers in that so it is implemented during the 12 5 year plan with this much of outlay now to all the farmers at an interval of 3 years this you need to remember we will provide it in the country at an interval of 3 years to all the farmers to apply appropriate recommended doses of nutrients for crop productivity and improving soil health and its fertility so 12 parameters again just remember these try to remember these that 
got 12 parameters so soil testing will be done first soil samples will be collected how we will tell the farmers about the soil uh, quality soil samples will be collected testing will be done of the soil on the 12 parameters this testing will be done you see the last paragraph of soil health card 12 parameters like pH, electrical conductivity, organic carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, potash, sulfur, zinc, iron, copper, manganese, boron and this will be given to every farmer. Okay, now come to the next one, Pramparagat Krishi Vikas Yojana. What this Pramparagat Krishi Vikas Yojana is? Regarding organic farming. Okay, so do you remember, so if it comes directly, directly just think about organic farming. Do you remember any other organic farming initiative proposed in the budget? Yes, yes. what is that? Organic value chain development. Yes, yes, good. So organic value chain development in Northeast region. That is the initiative there. Now this National Mission for Sustainable Agriculture, it also is, uh, it has many other missions, many other uh, projects as well. So it is part of, so four schemes, they come under this National Mission for Sustainable Agriculture. You can note down those. It's given in economic survey, so uh, the India book hasn't described those, you have done it in economic survey. So. National Mission for Sustainable Agriculture, it constitutes four other schemes. First one, rain fed area development. So rain fed area development, it, it again subsumes watershed development and soil conservation activities. So watershed development, for example, we have integrated watershed management program. IWMP soil conservation soil conservation activities second one is on farm water management on farm water management so that is to enhance the water efficiency water use efficiency then third one soil health management Fourth one, uh, climate change and sustainable agriculture, monitoring, modeling and networking. Climate change and sustainable agriculture, monitoring, modeling and networking. So these are parts of this. Networking, yes. Now come to price stabilization fund, come forward, price stabilization fund for cereals and vegetables. Very small point that's written there, DD Kisan channel and Kisan portal, farmers portal, Right? Do you see the farmer's portal? Mm -hmm. so farmer's portal is given there. M Kisan portal, all these are to be used. We have done it many times in the extension services. M Kisan portal. So all the mobile services any mobile services to help the farmers as extension services to come under M Kishan portal. For example, Nowcast, 
मैसेजिंग सर्विस टू टेल अबाउट द वेदर फोरकास्टिंग एंड ऑल डी डी किसान चैनल दिस डी डी किसान चैनल इज टू बी इन रीजनल लैंग्वेज एज वेल सो एवरी वर्ड द मेन ऑब्जेक्टिव इज लेट द फार्मर्स नो अबाउट द वेरियस प्रिवेलिंग बेस्ट प्रैक्टिस सो द स्पीकर विल कम फ्रॉम दूसरे यूनिवर्सिटीज रिसर्च इंस्टीट्यूट्स दे विल लेट नो द फार्मर्स दी प्रिवेलिंग प्रैक्टिस द बेस्ट वन and to make them understand to follow the uh, that could enhance them the awareness and go for more productivity then one point is price stabilization fund for cereals and uh, vegetables do you see that so price stabilization fund is there it's a central sector scheme okay central sector so certain schemes are central sponsored schemes certain one central sector schemes difference so no no central sector scheme is totally funded by the central government central sponsored co contribution by state government okay. so central and state both contribute in certain ratio for example 40 50 50 sorry 40 60 50 50 70 30 this kind of ratio the next one is pradhan mantri krishi sinchai yojana so they had in the slogan of har khet ko pani okay per drop more crop so more focus is given to uh, so you see the objective basic objective to boost irrigation facilities this yojana has been formulated to provide end to end solution in irrigation supply chain with water source distribution network and farm level applications so ensuring har khet ko pani and more uh, focus is given to the micro irrigation that is sprinkler and drip irrigation in the insurance scheme then you uh, also read pradhan mantri fasal bima yojana now india book doesn't include pradhan mantri fasal bima yojana because it has been launched this year and india book covers till december 2014 fifth sorry 15 okay and come below we have uh, crop diversification original green revolution states now we have been saying this problem in the green revolution states that they focus more over the wheat and rice cultivation because they had gained a lot because of the cultivation of these in terms of msp and all but this has limited the diversification they didn't diversify the crops leading to sudden soil deterioration of the areas and as the climate changes so they need to grow the crops which are more suitable to the available soils and that could conserve in moreover in a more sustainable manner so crop diversification is proposed then you can see this indian council of agriculture research so here you can find so the this research institute is basically interested with the objective to go for research and development in the agriculture area agriculture field now come to you see cyclone hodud question can come up hodud cyclone in uh, you see second paragraph last point where andhra and odisha coast it came okay now come to uh, somewhat last paragraph last third paragraph of this topic the council is also popularizing the floating and vertical farming in horticulture to enhance the productivity with lower cost 
So the council is doing pioneering efforts for breeding of precious fish of eastern India that is Hilsa. So the problem is the question can come up, Hilsa fish, where is it found prominently, where eastern India. Okay, then come to next to next paragraph. It has launched new initiatives. Very important this paragraph is Farmer First, that is Farmer Innovation Resource Science and Technology. So the objective is to enrich farmer scientific interface, scientist interface for technology development and application. So that is to improve the farmer scientist interface. So farmer first means that as we have seen in Savottam, the citizens were at the center stage. Here, farmer first, farmers are at the center stage. Second, student ready. So rural entrepreneurship, awareness development, Yojana. To integrate skill development and business module in agriculture education to capacitate the students to emerge as agri entrepreneurs. Okay, so because we had seen uh, many in ag agriculture universities as well the states which are uh, very uh, pro very large states or very well performing states in agriculture, they don't have much of the students in the agriculture universities there. The students they are falling in the numbers there. So the focus is over more awareness in those areas as well as retaining the students in those universities. So student ready, linking them to the rural entrepreneurship. Okay, then area, attracting and retaining youth in agriculture. So that is to attract and retain the youth there in agriculture system. Just a moment, keep on reading that. Okay, so where were we? Farmers first, farmer are to be at the center, student ready. Aria, Aria is what? Attracting and retaining youth in agriculture. See, each term they signify something first. In the first, F for farmers, innovation, resource, science and technology. Student ready, ready signifies for rural entrepreneurship and awareness development, Yojana. Aria, attracting and retaining youth in agriculture. It's an innovative program to retain the rural youth in agriculture develop a comprehensive policy for development of youth in rural areas and recognize the requirement of new age farmers and endeavor to fulfill the same. Mera Gaon Mera Goda. It involves agriculture experts from agriculture universities and ICR institutes for effective and deeper reach of scientific farming to the villages. Okay, Mera Gaon Mera Goda. So again, so means the experts are brought into being and to make sure the farmers they inculcate these scientific and research technologies into the agriculture development. So these are important, they can be asked directly, even not specifically what the ARIA is, but even they can be asked ARIA and uh, student ready. This are uh, the program of Ministry of Culture. Maybe the question can be broad based then it will be very easy to answer even if you remember these are by ICAR, Indian Council of Agriculture and Research, he specifically knows them. 
and try to remember them as part of the mains. If question comes specifically R and D recent development status in India, come and discuss, or so you can uh, handle such kind of questions. Then you come across dairy development. Okay, now do we have any budgetary initiative that has been proposed regarding dairy development? Do we have? Yes, we do have. What is that? Very good. One is Pashudan Sanjeevani. Yes. So one is Nakul Swasya Patra, Pashudan Sanjeevani, E Pashudan Heart. Pashudan Heart. Then one is uh, Nash Genomic Center for um, Breeding. Something like this is the another program. So. so go through the again. You can look over those initiatives because they can be asked. They are not given in uh, the India book, but as they are discussed in the budget, so they can be asked. I'll come further. National Livestock Mission, you know the purpose, the objective, even they have been discussed in the economic survey. Come to fisheries. Fisheries. So, India is the second largest fish producer in the world. Fisheries, yes. Yes, separately, yes, yes. Adding. Mm -hmm. After that. Next, next. Do you see that? Again, fisheries. So, India is the second largest producer of fish in the world. Around 5.5% five, five contributes to the global fish production. So, second rank after China. So, world leader is China in this case, and second is the India. So, India, despite we don't have any big fishing ground, marine fishing ground, right? Major fishing grounds are in the Atlantic Ocean. We had seen that, right? Near uh, first one is near this uh, Newfoundland Island, Gulf of Stream and uh, the Labrador current they meets and creates the fishing ground environment. Another is Gulf Stream, it converts into North Atlantic Drift, move towards UK and near North Sea, again one is formed. Then along the Norway coast, hmm? no, no, that is near Japan. Right. So here the same, uh, here it is uh, formed. Then the last one, fourth one is here near Japan. Kiroshi and Oyashiwo currently meets near Japan. But despite this India's second largest producer, how? Regarding aqu aquaculture, fresh, fresh water fish generally. So our marine fish, we don't have much of the capacity or much of the production in the marine fish development. But our major fish production happens through the aquaculture, through the fresh water fishes. 
you can read that. Aquaculture and rank second in the world after China. Okay, now come to the next topic: Indian fisheries and aquaculture. India is the second largest producer of fish, both in total and from aquaculture. So means even the total production, India second, and aquaculture also second. Marine fisheries. You see that the production they had stagnated in the last decade because most of the many stocks have been either overexploited and have reached maximum sustainable yields. Come to blue revolution. So, what do you mean by blue revolution? Blue revolution, marine products. So, basically, for growth of fisheries and aquaculture in the country. So, this is the basic one. The budget. The existing schemes of fishery sector have been brought under the umbrella of Blue Revolution for growth of fisheries and aquaculture in the country. It basically talks about Blue Revolution, marine products and all. So it has include fishery and aquaculture is also part of this. All right. So that's all about agriculture. Topics we पढ़ने हैं बर जो mark किया that you have to remember them anyway and the topic as a whole you can go through once ठीक है for the mains and prelims so schemes are important for both mains and prelims अदरवाइज जो mark किया बस उतना ही आपको cover up करना है वो आपको याद रखना है बस okay that's all for today in the next class we'll cover up remaining chapters Saturday. All right, people. So that's all for today's class. If you want us to bring more such videos, you uh, subscribe to our channel and hit like as well. It will encourage us to bring more such videos for you people. Thank you. Have a nice day and see you soon. Bye bye.